John chapter 2, and we'll be in verses 18 through uh, 25. And we'll also be looking at uh, Matthew chapter 24 today. So uh, we'll start with, uh, with, with 1 John. And this is a, a little bit of a different message that John takes a twist with. We've been talking about these fundamentals and we went through many of them. I'm going to summarize them soon because we've got about uh, eight different fundamentals out of this book. Today's fundamental is to guard ourselves against antichrists or against the spirit of antichrists. And that's a little bit confusing what he means by that. We'll try to unpack that. But uh, I think it's very applicable today. And I hope I can convince you that we're in a, living in an age, in a time when it's more important than ever. Let's listen to his words here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18. He says, little children, he's, he's speaking to, to us. He's calling us his little children. He's about probably in his late 80s when he writes this. He says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they, made, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you, having an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. John is turning up the heat here. He's, he's asking us to look at the big picture for a minute of life. The big picture. Every day I get caught up in whatever I've got to do that day. Uh, it, it usually has something to do with teaching or lecturing or working with students or devising some kind of clinical plan or something like that at work or working on my message or being a dad, dealing with three children, running them where they need to go or being a husband or all those things or some kind of financial concern or mowing the grass. All those things are what my day tend to be about and I try to get in there enough time for prayer and my friends and, and other things that need to be done and visiting people and all that. But John is saying, despite all those busy things that we all do and worry about every day, he's saying, let's live with the big picture in mind, with the end in mind, in fact. The overarching story. See, it's interesting because if we want to know how things are going to end, we, we can know that. We can know that. You know, when you watch a movie, you, uh, you don't know how it's going to end. Otherwise, it wouldn't be very interesting. But, uh, you know, in our life, in this history, it's moving towards something. And it's not random. Uh, the war, people in the world often think that, that things are just up to fate or good luck, bad luck just happens. But that's not the case. The Bible says that is not the way it is. That God knows exactly how things are going. Even the days of our lives... The things that happen to us are all under his control. History is leading somewhere very specific. And the Bible tells us what's going to happen in the end. The end times. The Lord is going to return. And he tells us specific events that will happen leading up to that time. God is guiding history. It's not a secret. John speaks about some interesting things here. Some terms that we need to get straight. He speaks of antichrists. These are false teachers who oppose Jesus, who oppose the Lord, who teach false things. He says they were among us, but they went out from us. They weren't really with us, and now they're teaching false truths. These are antichrists. He also speaks of the antichrist, one person, 
a man, a ruler who will rise up in the end days, in the final days before Christ will return. This man will rise up and he will be the lawless one. He will be evil incarnate. He will be the devil in flesh. But he will appear to be a sheep among in wolves' clothing. He will appear to be good. He will appear to be bringing answers, a so-called Mr. Fix-It. But in fact, he will be the most evil leader of all times, and he will deceive many. And we'll talk about that. He talks here about the last hour. What he means by that is the end of days, the last days which we are in now and are nearing, I think, the end of that age. And I'll tell you why in a minute. He speaks of these former disciples who were with them and then went away, so they weren't really ever from them. And he speaks of false teachers who rise up within the church and teach false things. And he talks about apostasy, this idea of falling away from God, which will happen in the end days. That the church will shrink, that less people will be concerned with spiritual things. There will be people involved with false gods and cults, but not with the true God of the Bible. And in fact, we see that happening. So two things are going to happen today. One, he's going to give us a warning, a warning of what's happening and what's going to come. And two, he's going to equip us for how to stand strong in difficult times. Now, uh, it begins with a warning and he talks about the Antichrist, this person, this man. Uh, this is the first occurrence in Scripture where Antichrist, that word, comes up in 2 John. Now, it's mentioned several different times. This is the first time in Scripture that the Apostle John actually uses the word the Antichrist. And he means by that, again, a proper name of a ruler who will rise up, energized by Satan in the last days. He will oppose God. He will deny Jesus Christ. He will claim to be the Messiah himself. He will unify all the nations of the world under one government, one currency, one system, the world system that we talked about last week. He will, he will uh, rule over that system and he will initially bring peace. And it will look as if to most people that things are going very well and then he will unleash a wrath of unbelievable evil on the world and we will see who he really is. He will claim to be God himself. He will claim to be the Messiah. Therefore, most people think he will be Jewish and from the European nations. And he will proceed to unleash a malevolent evil that the world has never seen. It will be something else. Now, there are many targets as to who this man might be. If you Google it, you can see uh, that the latest one is Vladimir Putin. I think they blame everything on Putin. If they don't like it, just say Putin did it, right? He's the Antichrist. Uh, they've said Prince William might be the Antichrist. This is the latest list I could get. Bill Clinton, still making the list for Antichrist, Pope Francis, and even President Trump. Many people have been called to be. We don't know who he's going to be. We don't know his name. It says his name will be 666, will be the number of his name. In, in Hebrew, it will probably add up to that number. He will be called the beast. He will likely originate from the European, the new European nations, from the Roman area, the, Italy probably and he will embody everything it means to oppose Jesus Christ that we know. He also speaks, though, of antichrists, plural, of false teachers and false prophets and fake preachers and false teachers and people who are teaching things that are not consistent with the Bible. Cult leaders, uh, David Koresh, people like this. Jehovah's Witness, churches that are false and that because why are they a cult? Because they change something about the truth of Scripture and they twist it and change it. Rather than believe what it says, they just change it a little bit and they usually say something false about who Jesus was. And that's why they're considered a cult. They don't follow what the Bible really says about who Jesus was. And Jesus told us these things would come and would increase in the days before he would return. I want to convince you today that we are in the end times. I'm not, a doom, I'm not giving you a doomsday message. I'm not setting a date. I don't know when it's going to be. Nobody knows the hour. Nobody knows the day. But the Bible says we can know the season of the time when Jesus will return. And I think it is very soon. Now, the last days technically started at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. That's when it started. 
They didn't know how long it was going to be. Paul thought Jesus would return in his lifetime. He didn't know. Nobody knew. But we would, I would give you some evidence for why I think it's time, the time is coming very near, and that what John speaks of today is specifically written for us, this generation. And it comes from the Olivet Discourse. If you have your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 24. This is a really an interesting, uh, the first gospel. Very interesting thing that Jesus said right before uh, the last week of his teaching. I want to read this to you. And listen to what he says. Listen to what he talks about. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 24 starts with verse 3. He's talking about these last days. And he says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? In other words, the end days. What are they going to look like before you come back? And he said, Jesus answered to them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, in other words, natural disasters in various places. And these are the beginning of the sorrows. Then they will deliver to you a tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. In other words, be persecuted. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. The many false prophets, those are those antichrists, will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, standing in the holy place, that's the Antichrist will, will set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as never been seen since the beginning of the world, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, there's the Christ... Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And he goes on to describe his second coming then. Well, here's the thing. From this, let me just point out a few things we see from what Jesus says the end times will be like. And I want it, us to think about how that might respond to the day we're living in. First of all, you know that Jesus was a prophet. He prophesied many things that have come to pass. Nothing that he's prophesied hasn't come to pass. Either it hasn't come yet, but he hasn't said anything that was wrong, is what I'm saying. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, wrote this to the children of Israel. These are the words of God. God said, I will rise, raise up a prophet from among his people, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak all that I command him to. That's Jesus. He was, taught, he was prophesied in the days of, of Moses. And the Jews knew this, and they knew that he was coming. So when John the Baptist showed up on the scene, they asked him, Are you he? And he said, No, but there's one who is coming, who is the one, and that was Jesus. And then Jesus gave us many prophecies. From this Olivet Discourse, we see that in the last days, many false prophets and false teachers and cults will rise up. We will see a rise in this even more as false teachers rise up and say many things that are false and not corresponding to Scripture. They will make claims about Jesus, about God, and about salvation that are simply untrue. Uh, we have seen this. We continue to see it. And I think keep your eyes out for more of this. Second thing was world politics. He said there will be wars and rumors of wars in an increasing way. Say, what's new? We've always had wars. I know that. But he says they will be like birth pangs, like the natural disasters. That, As you know, as, as labor happens in a woman, she begins to have contractions and they get 
what? Harder and closer together as she gets closer to delivery. And that's the way he describes in the Bible that the end days will be, that these natural disasters will increase, that the uh, uh, world politics will get worse, that hatred will become worse, the children will stop obeying their parents, that uh, war wars will increase in their, in their violence. Well, think about that. We now have nuclear weapons. We could never have done the violence that we could do now with one, one button. We talk about North Korea and, and the thought of this uh, uh, nuclear weapon. You know, and in the 21st century, let me give you this one, 100 million people died in wars just in the last century, in the 19, uh, in, uh, 20, 21st century. Uh, 100 million people died in wars more than all years combined. Uh, that's the 20th century, I mean. See, uh, more people are dying. Just in that one century, more people died than all the other centuries before. And that's what he says. It will get worse. The violence will get worse. Natural disasters increased in earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, floods, plagues. Again, you might say, what's new? We've always had earthquakes and floods. Just listen to this statistic. Just in the United States, from 1991 to 2004, nine of the ten greatest natural disasters as ranked by insurance costs happened. Nine out of ten. Five of the costliest hurricanes happened. Tornadoes, and then Katrina came after that. So, natural disasters, yes, they're happening, but they're happening with greater frequency and with greater amount of disaster. We just heard about what's happened in Texas. It seems like every day there's another natural disaster that's happening. Signs in the heavens. He talks about, uh, he goes on to describe changes in the stars, sun, and moon. Are we, are we not always hearing about another sign in the heavens, uh, an eclipse that hadn't happened in how long and it's going to happen again in so many years? And then there's another sign coming up September 23rd, I think, that's some kind of uh, astrological sign. He said there will be increasing numbers and increasing interest in astrological signs in the heavens before I come back. He said there will be a breakdown of society. Lawlessness will increase and he specifically said in another scripture it will be like the days of Noah. We did that study on Noah and you remember how the lawlessness and the immorality and the corruption just increased to an unbelievable amount. He says it will be like that. There will be increasing violence, increasing destruction, blasphemous activities, and I would argue that Hollywood is the moral polluter of the world. He says that there will be apostasy, a falling away from the church. You know, in 19, between 1960 and the year 2000, if you just look at those years, listen to this. The United Church of Christ lost 64% of its numbers of people. The Baptist denomination lost 57% of its membership. The Episcopal Church lost 50%. And we see even preachers and teachers denying the deity of Christ and denying who God is and what, what He's about. Even people who are supposed to be ordained don't even claim the truth about God. So we see this falling away. Jesus said that would happen. He said in the last days the church will become weaker and smaller and the message will become watered down. He also said something good. He said the gospel would reach the world. He said it would be a, the, the message of the gospel would reach the entire world. Imagine how impossible that would have seemed to the disciples or to people even a hundred years ago before the internet, before technology. Now it's, it is in fact reaching the ends of the earth the Jesus movie was viewed by 7 billion, with a B, people. More and more people are hearing the gospel. He said that persecution would increase, and we again talked about believers being killed. Even in this country, Christians are targeted, and, and we're, the, we're the only group about that we can't speak openly about our faith. We're being persecuted, killed by Muslims. Jesus claimed prior to his return that... that and this is the most important one, that the, the nation of Israel would be reestablished. Now, this is so important because we really couldn't talk about it being close to Jesus' time if we wanted to go by Scripture until Israel was reestablished, which it was in 1947. 
But you know, even in the 1920s and 30s, I read commentaries of people saying, the Bible must have gotten it wrong because there is no way that Israel could ever become a nation again. It must be wrong. The Bible must have gotten it wrong because it couldn't happen. And then miraculously, after 1,878 years, the nation of Israel became established, re-established again, and the Jewish people were brought back into a nation state and Jerusalem was reestablished. Amazing. And that's really when the time clock began that said we are in this age of the end times. I believe that's absolutely true. I believe, I don't know the date, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I believe we're getting close. I believe that Jesus is knocking at the door, and that's why we're also seeing more and more people come to Christ in great numbers in the Muslim world, we're seeing people convert to Christianity by the groves. We're seeing people turn to God at the same time we're seeing this falling away of the church in America. We're seeing the church in China grow. I mean, it's, it is just outstanding what's happening and it all has to do with exactly what he said would happen as birth pangs. It will increase in intensity and in frequency and we see these things every day on the news. He spoke about false Christs. And that's one of the things that he said would increase. And I think it's important for us to understand that these false teachers, cults, false preachers, all of this will increase in number and, and increase in, in amount until it culminates in the Antichrist. You know that if we look back at the Old Testament, the prophets were all preceding Christ. Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, all the great prophets of the Old Testament were Christ-like. They were types of Christ and they kept looking forward to the Messiah. So it, it ramped up. You had all these prophets that looked like Christ and then Jesus came. And then you see the downfall towards the end when the Antichrist will come. We'll see these false Christs rising up, claiming to either be God or be have a new way to learn uh, faith or saying something different about Jesus or changing the faith. And then eventually that will culminate in the coming of Antichrist uh, himself. A man energized by Satan, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He will be the climax of this. Jesus said there will be a devastating increase in evil, false religions and false gods and cults and climax at the end. And don't, He said it will not be a surprise to us that we're in the season, but it will surprise us all when he comes back. Even believers will never know the day. We shouldn't speculate about that. But it will just appear as an unexplained catastrophe to unbelievers. So why is John writing about this to the church? He's saying this because he's seeing people in his church in his day leave the church and then teach false things about Jesus. And he's saying that's the spirit of Antichrist. He's calling it out. He's hearing this distorted teaching about Jesus in his own flock and he's saying this is a sign that will be in the end days and it's for us today as well men and women who once lived among the body went out and joined uh, the evil in the world and then he then he, he warns us and then he equips us okay he equips us in other words arms us as believers to make a ready defense against these antichrists to prepare us to discern the truth he says that in, in, in the verse in 1 John, he says, Christians bear an anointing. I don't know if you saw that or not. That means a rubbing on of something that protects you. And if you're saved, you have that. And Christ means that you're anointed with a special gift of the Spirit to recognize truth, to discern truth, to see godly wisdom from worldly wisdom, to understand the difference. And he says this anointing, this endowment of the Spirit, will protect you in difficult times. It will never leave you. It's a built-in detector, if you will, to, to identify falsehood and to think differently from the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's about the mystical experience of salvation when you get on your knees and you ask God to be your Savior. That spirit that comes into your heart will change your heart and give you a different guiding light in your life. And he says that anointing will always be with you it will never leave you if you, in fact, really know the Lord. So he asks us to ask ourselves, do we really know him? If anyone claims to be a Christian but contradicts what Jesus said and who he was, then he doesn't have this guiding light, this anointing that John talks about. 
If we have it, it will never leave us. And it will give us an ability to see truth and know truth in a unique way. And read the scripture and, and recognize what it says. And of course, we grow in that as we grow in our faith. It takes time. It doesn't come overnight, but it grows over time. And he will give us that. See, he says in here that there is one God, that there was one Messiah who proclaimed one truth, who proclaimed one gospel, and that brings unity, right? One God, one Savior, one truth, one gospel, and one people, one body. And he says that if we in fact know that truth and stay and read it and know it and study it, that we will all be uh, in peace together, that we won't have conflict among us as long as we're basing our, what we have in, in truth of the Bible. We'll stand strong. But in fact, when false truths come up, when false teachers arise, there will be conflict. There will be discord. There will be difficulty among the body because the false truth will be recognized by those who have the anointing of God and that will cause conflict, right? As long as we're all in the truth, there should not be conflict among us. That we should all be living under that one truth. Now some people say, well, there ought to be many paths to God. I mean, uh, you know, but what about I take this path or that path or this path or that path? Wouldn't they all eventually go to God? Well, Jesus says no. He says there's one truth, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And only through me can you really reach the Father as far as salvation is concerned. There's the only one way. I was thinking about, I have all these keys on my uh, keychain, and there's one key on there that will get me in the church. And a lot of times when I come, I have to fiddle around with these different keys to try to get the right one. I know it's usually between this one and this one, but I have to fiddle around, and if it's raining, it's sometimes hard, or if it's dark out or whatever. But only one key will open up the door to the church. I can try all the other ones. They look very much the same, but they're just a little bit different. Some of them look so much the same that I can't even tell them apart until I actually try to see which one will fit in the door, and then that one will open up the church. That's sort of the way the path is to God. There are these false teachers that come up with things that look very similar to Christianity, but there's just some differences, some wrinkles that are differences that are not true. That's what he's talking about. Those will be hard for us to discriminate. It's not difficult for us to tell the difference between Islam and Hinduism and Christianity, really, but it might be very difficult as the end times continue for us to tell the true faith, and it's going to be based in Scripture. So, application is this. Recognize that we're in, the seasons of the la we're in the season of the last days. Be prepared. Be prepared. God is coming. Jesus is knocking. He's, he's close. He's coming soon. We don't know when. We need to be watchmen on the wall to recognize the signs of the times and to uh, tell others about that. It is, we, we are in those days. But be careful not to promote pessimism. I think that's important. The young people today speak a lot about feeling doomed in this world. That they just will never be able to rise to the level their, their pa parents or grandparents did. That they just won't have the opportunities. That the student loans are too expensive. They just don't have the, the colleges is too much money. Um, on and on and on and on. You'll hear young people say they just feel doomed and feel downward mobility. That's not what we're talking about. Christians can interpret the framework of the Bible and realize that, yes, it may be a difficult time, but we're leading towards a better time, a time when Jesus will return, when we will be with him, we'll live with him forever, and in fact, it is not something to be pessimistic about. Secondly, we have to arm ourselves for deception, study the word regularly, pray, worship God, be with other Christians that can point out things in us that we can't see, don't be led, led astray by the false teachings that are out there. And seek God's truth. Seek His truth through prayer and through reading His Word. John's plan was that we would be equipped for these things when they come up. Third, fight for unity. This is the last point. Fight for unity among the body of Christ. You know, sometimes I think that we major on the minors. And I want to be clear here that we can have unity 
We can have unity as a body of believers as long as we stand on the truth. And we should, we should basically think about the essentials of the faith and stand on those and realize there are some other things that are out there in other circles that are maybe not as important as the essentials. We don't want to get too carried away with uh, majoring on those minors. Listen to this. As Crystal puts this slide up, I want to read this from 1 Corinthians 12. Paul said, There is one body, but it has many parts. And, but all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit, and so we are formed into one body. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. In Christ we are all one body. I want to end on the note of promoting unity among us as a church, as believers, because, you know, as you can see in that circle, there are central things like the fact that there's one God, okay, that we're monotheistic, that, that there's a trinity, okay, he exists as a trinity, that Jesus is his son, that he came to save us, and that that's the way to salvation. Those kinds of things are absolutely central, and we might argue about some other things that we should throw in there. We believe in believer's baptism and things like that, but, you know, there's other things we could talk about that are just probably not really as central to that, and sometimes we get into disunity, and we get into uh, arguments and conflict when we're majoring on things that are out in these outer circles, okay, like what kind of music we should do, or whether we should sing from this hymn or that. Or, you know, what order the worship should be in, or, I don't know, what we should do to the parking lot, or whether or not we should have guitar, I don't know, all these different things that come up, you know. I want us to remember that it's the essentials that we're basing our faith on, and it's those things that will bring us unity and keep us in one body. We also need to promote healing of broken relationships and fractures when they come up. When we heal bones, we have to splint them for a while and take the weight off of them. Same thing with broken relationships. And I think it's important that we stay committed to healing broken, brokenness within the body of Christ and that we stay unified based on the essentials and committed to the truth and the sound doctrine that's taught here. The Christian fundamentals, and that's why we're doing this book. But we should also have grace when others may be don't believe exactly what we do about things that are maybe up for debate. There are those things in the faith that we just are subject to interpretation. So I leave us with that. Uh, we're going to close with a song, and Crystal's going to come up with Paulette and, and close us in a song from the chorus book. And I'll pray. I want us to leave on a thought of promoting uh, unity and love among us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've talked today about the end of days as not a pessimistic thing, but a framework to, to live life by. That you will come again, that times are heating up, that it seems that we are in, in the end of the age. We don't know how long that might be. It could be today or tomorrow. It might be another 50 years, 100 years. I don't know. It could be longer. We don't know. 